we're going to wait another moment or so to allow folks to enter and then we'll get started. All right, good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Kay from Greenlight Bookstore and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Jennifer Natalia Fink launching her new book, All Our Families, Disability, Lineage and the Future of Kinship. She will be talking with Petra Cuffers, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just wanna say a huge thanks to Jennifer, Petra, and the team at Beacon Press for making this happen and to all of you for showing up. We're grateful for your support and for the chance to make space for conversation and connection. Now, just a couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat, say hi and where you're tuning in from. That's a great way to show your appreciation for our panelists and to interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by either of our panelists, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, All Our Families, is available for sale, pre-order, from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush Ave stores, where you can purchase Jennifer's book and many others on site. You can also order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the US. I'll drop the buy link in the chat as well. As thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we are offering 10% off the featured book. Enter coupon code GREENLIGHTEVENTS10 into the coupon discount section at checkout online for 10% off. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer tonight is Petra Cuppers, disability culture activist and community performance artist. Petra received the American Society for Theater Research's Best Dance Slash Theater Book Award, the National Women's Caucus for the Arts Award for Arts and Activism, and her performance poetry collection, Gut Botany, was named one of the top 10 US poetry books of 2020 by the New York Public Library. She is the artistic director of the Olympias, an international disability culture collective, and co-creates Turtle Disco, a somatic writing studio, with her wife, poet and dancer Stephanie Height, from their home in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Petra will be reading tonight from her new book, Echosoma, Pain and Joy in Speculative Performance Encounters, and she will be speaking with our featured author, Jennifer Natalia Fink, Director of the Program in Disability Studies and a professor of English at Georgetown University. She is the author of six books and the founder of the Guerrilla Press, a nonprofit promoting youth literacy through bookmaking. Fink is the winner of the Dana Award for the novel and the Catherine Doctorow Prize for Innovative Fiction, as well as a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award. First and foremost, she is a mother. The transformative experience of parenting her autistic daughter is the center of her work. Jennifer's new book, All Our Families, is a memoir qua provocation hailed as a magisterial crip queer reimagining of our disabled pasts and futures by Robert McCrewer, author of Crip Theory. 
Informed by queer and critical race theory and weaving together stories of her family members with socio-historical research, Fink illustrates how the eradication of disabled people from family narratives is rooted in racist, misogynistic, and anti-Semitic sorting systems. Analyzing our racist and sexist care systems, Fink exposes their inequities as a source of stigmatizing ableism and makes a powerful argument for the reclamation of disability as a history, a culture, and an identity, one which challenges all of us to refigure disability within the family as a way towards a more inclusive and flexible structure of care and community. Jennifer and Petra are going to start us off reading from their books and then they'll be joining in conversation with each other and with all of you. So without further ado, please take it away, Jennifer and Petra. Thank you so much, Kay, for that. Um, there's a little more ado, a little more much ado. Um, I wanna thank all of you out there on the Zoom for coming tonight amidst war, COVID and all the rest. I am Jennifer Natalia Fink. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am a white middle-aged woman in a red shirt with black hair and uh, a mixed background. If you would like to turn the live transcript on for further description, you can click the CC at the bottom and that will turn it on for automatic Zoom captioning. Please make your particular body mind comfortable as the night unfolds. Welcome. I'm so delighted to be here today to share all our families, disability lineage, and the future of kinship with you. I am on unceded Piscataway and Kanoe territory in glamorous Gaithersburg, Maryland. And I encourage you to take a moment to Google whose territory you are on. And once you do that, we'll take a moment. Just Google, whose land am I on? So once you do that, you just can't unknow it, can you? you can put it in the chat if you like. What are we gonna do about that? Um, I actually think Petra Cuppers and Echo Soma and the amazing work that she's doing about land and body mind can maybe help us think about how to go beyond virtue signaling to embodied action. Dun, 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 dun. That sounds promising. But before we get started, I do have to um, thank so many people. Thanks to Joanna Green, my editor at Beacon, as well as Priyanka Ray, Christian Coleman, Allison Rodriguez, and the whole Beacon team who've done such a fantastic job on every aspect of this project from concept to cover. I love the cover, it's beautiful and designed by a disabled person. Thanks to Amanda Annis, my amazing agent at Trident Media, who turn, helped me turn kind of a glimmer of an idea into an actual book. And thanks to Jean Yoon and Kay and the Greenlight team for the, their hard work in making this event happen. And a huge thanks to Petra Cuppers for sharing the stage and for her really brilliant foundational work. She's not only my co-reader and interrogator to, uh, interlocutor tonight, but her work is actually kind of the textbook for my Disability in the Arts classes at Georgetown. So if I have students out there, this is the Petra Cupper, yes. Um, students in the audience, this is your chance to um, engage the text directly, shall we say. And I want to thank all our, my families, especially my daughter, Nadia, the joy and center of my life, and Sarah Sohn, my partner in parenting and so much more. And thanks to Rona and cousin XY, Grandma Adina and all our disabled kin. You'll hear about them in a moment. Zikrona Livraka, let their memory be a blessing. Okay, so now I'm gonna begin at the begin and read the opening gambit, if you will, which frames the problem that I'm interested in this book. How delineating disability from family leads to trauma and ableism. And then I'm gonna read a teeny bit about of the end, which kind of offers some 
I hesitate to say solutions, but okay, I'll say it, solutions to the problem. You'll have to read the book to see how I get from that problem to the solution. I'll then turn things over to Petra. We'll have a chat and maybe you'll chat back. I hope you will. So here it is. And I'm gonna turn my background on now that I'm not um, shamelessly waving the book in your face. I'm seven. I'm walking through room after room in my grandparents' cavernous Long Island house, looking for my cousin. Cousin, cousin, I call, wishing I knew his name. Cousin XY, I call. I know he's a boy, and I'm a geneticist's daughter. Chromosomes count. Cousin XY visits me in dreams. He has his father's eyes. My cousin XY was born in 1972 with Down syndrome and immediately abandoned. He was listed only as baby XY. I always knew my aunt and uncle had, quote, given away their son at birth. His very existence was explained to me as a tragedy, a crisis, an aberration that perhaps science could one day prevent. In the hospital on the day he was born, his mother refused to look at his face, so the family story went, take him away. His, my grandfather, a family doctor, the family medical expert was firm, give him up. You can start over, you have a right to real children. He will be happier there. Where was there? I often wondered where my cousin was, who he was. Silence in two neurotypical children quickly replaced him in the family narrative. On the rare occasions when his existence came up, Everyone gave them away, was repeated as gospel truth. And indeed, in the 1970s, institutionalization, abandonment, and excision from the family narrative was still too often the fate of those labeled incurable at birth. But I discovered that wasn't the whole truth. As with most families, the story of my family's disability lineage had far more strands than I realized. In 2017, when I was visiting a far-flung branch of my family in Manchester, UK, I discovered that there was another cousin in my family with Down syndrome, also on my father's side, buried in plain sight, Rona. Born in Scotland in 1946, two plus decades before cousin XY, Rona lived in apparent happiness, first with her nuclear family in Glasgow, and then in a group home called Cosgrove, which her mother helped found for disabled Jewish people. True to her name, Rona means joy in Hebrew. She lived, by all accounts, a joyous Jewish life. Two of my family members had been written out of the family story, delineated from our lineage. I mourned what I never had both a lived relationship with my cousins and a family myth that it could include them. I wondered how the knowledge of a rich, deep history of disability in my family would have changed my experience of my own daughter's diagnosis at age two as a disabled, non-speaking autistic person. If I had grown up playing with cousin XY, would we have experienced her disability as part of the warp and weave of our lineage, instead of as a personal disaster, rending us from the fabric of family. These were the questions that led me to think about disability lineage and what the implications of repressing, hiding, finding, and celebrating it might be for disabled people and their families everywhere. By cutting me off from knowledge of my disabled cousins, I had no source of disability knowledge and history in my family. Their lives were treated as extraordinary, disposable, and traumatic. So traumatic that the very fact of them was hidden, erased from the story our family told about itself. This is typical of how disability is narrated in the family myth myths passed down from one generation to another. Disability is erased, repressed, covered over. Families delineate, destroy the connection between generations of, disabled, of disabled, 
people, their families, and their caretakers. Our disabled kin are not merely misrepresented, they are written out of the story altogether. By examining the ways family excise disability from their stories, I began to see how disability is fundamentally shaped by this omission. The way we assign meanings to bodies and minds, establish norms and otherize and stigmatize according to perceptions of ability is inseparable from how we name and claim our kin. Family is defined and produced by eradicating disability lineage often making the inevitable appearance of disability within a given family a crisis, a trauma to be erased, effaced, unwritten. I refer to this process as delineation, the separation of disabled people from their lineage. Now, the word delineate literally means to mark off with lines and thus separate, but it includes the word lineate, derived from lineage, family ancestry. The delineation I'm examining here is sometimes literal, as with my cousin XY. It is sometimes rhetorical, as with the suppression of my cousin Rona and her disability from the family narrative. But see, this is the interesting thing. Delineate also means to describe or portray a form of inclusion. So within the word itself lies the potential to relineate, to sew a family member back into the fold, to, to describe, portray, and thus connect. So we're gonna do a little bit of delineation, relineation here. Let me introduce you to Grandma Adina. I wear my grandmother's ring. I'm not giving you the finger, it's the fourth finger, it's okay. It's a ring finger, not that other one. I wear my grandmother's ring on my fourth finger. It's an intricately carved, quirky little garnet, precious only to me. I'm married to my grandmother, I say to anyone who asks. It's a queer form of irony that marks my longest, deepest love, Adina Chalef Lewis, a tiny eccentric leftist who adored me, Jewish folk dancing, and Adele Davis's health food regime, possibly in that order. Though she was a terrific student who tutored all the other kids, her father made her drop out of high school because she was a girl. Adina found a way out of poverty through a Jewish socialist community in New York, where she met and married my grandfather, Harold Howe Lewis, an educator and artist. Adina never worked outside the home, couldn't drive, and never wrote a check in her entire life. My grandfather managed everything. Even by the standards of their generation's strictly defined gender roles, my grandparents were extreme. Yet they had one of the most loving partnerships I've ever witnessed. In their retirement home, the staff dub dubbed them the lovers because they were always holding hands or walking with the arm of my tall, handsome grandfather wrapped around my tiny grandmother's fragile frame. Only after they passed did I consider the way disability shaped this incredible partnership. Adina Chalef Lewis was deaf. She hated her hearing aids and couldn't really lip read. She was hard of hearing from birth. I'm not sure exactly when she became officially deaf. But my grandmother spoke of disability only with disgust. She saw disabled children as disposable tragedies. I can see the face she made when disability was mentioned. Tragic, but also disgusting. Was that how she felt about her own hearing impairment?
Grandma Adina spoke in a near shout in heavily Yiddish inflected Brooklynese. Fearful of the outside world, she was seemingly content to be a balabusta, a kind of super housewife with left wing leanings who insisted that feminism meant the right to stay home. Completely cut off from any notion of disability as a positive identity or culture, Adina Shalef Lewis was the most ebullient, loving presence in my life. She found everything I did worthy of celebration and made light of any annoying char character traits I revealed. My mother inherited her impaired hearing, but not her shame. My mother lip reads, purchases, purchases every possible gadget to access or amplify sound and language, and religiously wears the latest and greatest hearing aids. Whereas Grandma Adina appeared to have little ambition, my mom went from a working class Brooklyn childhood to a marriage to a prominent scientist to a career as a high school special ed teacher to, at age 50, a PhD from Harvard, no less, and a second career as a college professor. She has published three books and has de dedicated her life to training special education teachers and researching dyslexia. She could not be more interested in the outside world. Her hearing impairment has increased steadily over the course of this noteworthy career. Yet only as I was finishing writing this book did I think of including the two people closest to me, the women who formed me, who loved me the most, one whose ring I wear on my finger and the other whose broad smile I wear on my face. Only then did I con in consider including them in my disability lineage after I'd written the book. Shame and stigma about disability are so great that I had internalized them, unconsciously refusing to acknowledge that my very own mother and grandmother were disabled for I would have had to confront another facet of my own ableism, my own fear of deafness. In developing a disability lineage, we not only uncover lost, hidden, disappeared family members who are institutionalized, abandoned, murdered, or otherwise cut off from the family tree, we may also discover that the family members who we never thought of as disabled, who perhaps never thought of themselves as such, were and are disabled. By valuing the diversity of body minds among our kin, we rediscover the disability lineage right in front of our eyes, their deaf ears listening intently right across from the dinner table from us. We also confront their erasure, how marginalized or otherwise mistreated they were because of their disabilities. It's not that disability lineage is always hidden away. It was right there in front of us, but shame and stigma kept us from seeing it as our rich inheritance. And I'm gonna read one more little bit, if that's all right. with the rather, you know, grand subtitle of rending and mending the fabric of the universe. Did I write that? I guess I did. Let's rend and mend the fabric of the universe, okay? Though we planned for two years, COVID-19 made us turn my daughter Nadia's bat mitzvah into a gil mitzvah, a sort of preamble to the main event to be held in a COVID-free free future. And spoiler alert, we did get to hold the bat mitzvah, but we're going to talk about the gil mitzvah. Nadia prepared Torah commentary. I prepared to cry. We chose her dress together. We went online to Bloomingdale's, Grandma Adina's favorite store. I'm exposing my own bouginess here. Grandma Adina adored the discounts and the unsweetened soft serve yogurt. Even Adele Davis would approve. Nadia adored all the dresses. I can't choose, she typed. Pick two, I suggested. She chose three. We ordered and hoped for the best. The purple plaid one with the unlikely metallic pink accents she finally chose to wear was gorgeously blingy and fit perfectly. Grandma Dina loved such unlikely color combinations. The gil mitzvah was more moving than I imagined anything on Zoom could ever be. Nadia's words, Nadia's prayers, Nadia's thoughts, Nadia's passion for Torah, for questions of God and speech and silence. Only when I was looking at the haphazard iPhone pics I took of, us, took of us afterward, did I notice how Nadia's woven plaid echoed Rona's taffeta. Same pattern, same confidence. The term lineage itself gestures towards this expanded sense of belonging meaning a collective as well as an individual ancestry. 
This double sense of heritage is precisely where disability lineage and ancestry meet, where our personal family histories and personages join with the larger ancestral memory. I pray to my deaf grandmother and remember all our disabled grandmothers. A sense of belonging to a greater story is integral to all humans. In imagining a future in which I will certainly be disabled if I am so lucky to be alive, I have my deaf grandmother to guide me. Grandma Adina can now show me how to live joyously with a disability that she disowned during her life. I have Rona now reclaimed in all her sass to help me better understand and care for my daughter. And I have cousin XY whose absence still haunts me, but with whom I feel more deeply connected with after this deep dive into our mutual disability lineage. In my dreams, he plays cards with me in my grandfather's basement. Thank you. I'll turn things over to Petra. Thank you so much. Thank you for this beautiful and moving engagement with lineage. And I will, I hope to continue this. Oops. I was just gonna drop something in here and then I managed to click it away. You know, this is how it always goes with, here we go, with Zooms. Thank you. And I echo everybody's beautiful applause. I found mine. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me to be to be part of this presentation and to celebrate your book. My own book just came out as well, and I'm very glad to be sharing this with you. And I think we're going to continue with the themes of lineage and celebration and revaluing what disability means in our lives. So I'm going to begin. I just I just dropped in a link for everybody who would like to have a, a closer look. Um, what you see there is is um, something that is is. I hope you will support independent bookstores like Greenlight by by purchasing the book. But you can also my book can also be read for free online. That was a really important part of my my academic journey to make a book available. Um, as an as a, a free, accessible, economically uh, just accessible book, so that fellow disabled people can read it. So I come to you right now from Anishinaabe territory. I'm in Michigan. Ypsilanti, Michigan, is how it is colonially known, and I am a white cis queer woman. I'm a disabled woman. I wear yellow glasses and a nice velvety, very very nice to the touch uh, top, and you will hear in a minute why that might be important. And I'm in front of a, a pink background, and that pink is mirrored in my lipstick. And I have a nearly bald head, which is also very touchable. So that's me. And I'm going to show you now a picture of, of my book, which I think is a very nice conversation partner. Here we go. So you see here a slide of Ecosoma Pain and Joy in Speculative Performance Encounters. And that's the title of the book. It just came out with the University of Minnesota Press. And I'm going to audio describe a little bit what's on this, what's on this photo here. So we're seeing, or you hopefully see most of <laughs> the words Ecosoma, and they are entwined with a different kind of lineage, a plant lineage, a kind of a wider embedment in the sensual and material world that we are part of. So the plants are twining through the words ecosoma, and next to that is a, is a human being, and this human being is covered in mud, in a kind of uh, gray white mud, and we see a, a breast brace, and this person is Yulia Arakelian from Wobbly Dance, which is a, um, an Oregon-based dance company, and her eyes are closed and we see some of the mud, the mud on her eyelids and even on her eyelashes. And she's emerging out of the plants as well as retreating into the plants. There's a deep interweaving going on in this image. And the heart of Ecosoma is about finding joy in small moments, filling small moments with artful attention. And as you will hear in a minute, as I'm sharing with you a little bit from the introduction, 
This is about the stories, myths, and touch, touch of bodies, touch of histories, and touch of material. Touch of material, that's what I'm going to invite you into right now. I'm going to stop my share. Okay. I now invite you to close your eyes for a second, if that is accessible to you and if it feels good for you, and to just take a breath. Take that breath and think for a second about the concept of lineage as Jennifer has introduced it to us, of connecting this word that is so central to her book. And use that connecting right now to feel what you are sitting on right now. Connect with the materiality of the object that you're sitting, standing, or lying on. What is it that you are on? What is it made of? Who else has touched it? Is there a personal lineage or heritage? Is there an impersonal one? Is there a connection to the kind of shape of the object? Maybe you cite some modernist lines like this, this leather sofa that I'm sitting on. Maybe you're finding a connection to fellow lived creatures. Again, I'm sitting on a leather sofa, so I'm touching leather as I'm sitting here. Maybe you're sitting on cotton, maybe on wood or on plastic. And just for a second, let your thoughts run to lineage and material. What is the connection between you as a human being, as a breathing, sitting, lying, standing being, and plastics? And for many of us, that connection is severed, right? There is no connection. It's just guilt and upset and just harshness. But what if for a minute, we touched in with a kind of kindness and gentleness and tenderness that we try to live with in disability culture? What if we touched in with these organic materials a long, long time ago that fell into a lake or a sea that got covered with sediments, that got pressured, the earth pressure, 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 building, and the organic materials transforming, dancing, reshaping into oil. What if we imagine that oil emerging from the earth by people who drill for it? If we think about the work condition of people who drill, of oil riggers, think about the people who move that oil through the pipelines to factories, to the various condensing towers, towers, the people who oversee polymerization, or the people who are part of that circle, that cycle of plastic generation. So what if we think about all these moments of humanity and unhumanity, all these moments of more than humans and humans that touch, that come into what it is that you are right now sitting on that's touching you. And take another breath. And think that through for whatever it is that you're on. Wool, the wood, the tree, the logger, the artisan or the factory worker in China. And just for a minute, honor all those lineages too. All the larger webs that we are woven into. And those are my lineage, the ones that I'm looking at in Ecosoma. The book collects my experiences of embodied performance witnessing. And it attempts to figure out those special moments, these ecosoma moments, I call them, when time shifts, when new sensations emerge in the middle of involved witnessing, 
in the encounter zones between self and environment and on specific lands. Ecosoma sensing connects with materials, objects, and sites that one's moving body meets. I find that sometimes my moving self in Dunsley openness can sense more or differently than when I'm immobile, even though, or maybe because, my disabled movement is painful. Even sitting here, I'm experiencing pain. I have sensations of pain in all my limbs. And yet, I'm also sitting cradled by this couch. Ecosoma sensing is interested in the kind of gaps and opportunities that open up when phenomenological awareness of being in the world encounters uncomfortable spaces, the way we just in encountered the oil space. That discomfort opens up when your cuddly blanket, and here is my cuddly blanket right next to me. This is the one I'm holding on to. This is the one I might be touching when I'm anxious. When this cuddly blanket is made of water-threatening plastics whose tiny fibers might clog a fish's digestive system. Your own stomach contracts at the thought, even while you hold on to differences between your own gut and a fish's sensing. My play here with the I, you, and we pronouns is a deliberate invitation not to over-identify, but to wonder. This being with and alongside elements and non-human others is central to my book's query, and particularly in one of the chapters when lots of disabled people go swimming together and hang out with salamanders. So that's kind of the, the joyous heart of my book is going swimming going swimming with fellow disabled people and encountering water and everything that that signifies the way that we just encountered oil. And in Ecosoma inquiry, my own self is never unmarked or the quiet center of a self. I'm part of both a human and a non-human ecology, and I'm part of a set of historically and culturally grown relations. All of this brings embeddedness and entanglement. In my case, myself is marked as white, a citizen of the perpetrator nation Germany, a disabled wheelchair or scooter user, a settler on Nishnabe territory, a consumer in a global north economy, a cis woman, queer, an artist, an academic, in pain and in joy. All of these markers complicatedly arise to my being in the world. They shape my sensations and my fantasies. Now I'm gonna, I'm in the book, I now talk about various ones of the lineages for the book. Disability culture, queer phenomenology, ecopoetics, long list of academic words. And I talk about various ones of the practitioners whose work I engage in these chapters and who all call on their ancestors in different ways and create their own lineage academic, artistic, spiritual, or other. I honor multiple ways of coming into oneself, and hence I use the term body, mind, spirit in this book at multiple points. And you can see as you're listening to that term, how does that resonate with you, body, mind, spirit? The first one of these lineages I cited above is probably the one least written about, disability culture. I am encultured as disabled which means in my case, left out, not thought about, discarded, and on a regular basis in my case, sitting at the bottom of the steps. But I also co-create disability culture, reaching toward resilience from an unstable position, trying to not be lonely in my singular and painful form of embodiment, being okay with being the odd one out and being jubilant when I am not, when I am indeed swimming with other disabled people. My particular somatic way of being in the world encompasses these things in pain, unstable when on my feet, out of the talk sphere when sitting in my wheelchair at belt level and with a party happening above me, unable to get into most dance studios or experimental performance venues or private homes, and of course also being mistaken for other wheelchair users on a regular basis. All these sensations and experience shape and characterize my perspective in this book. 
Other disabled people have different markers of their exclusion and their sites of joy, as have others with different cultural lineages whose forms of embodiment and enmindment have been denigrated, often with deadly results, by the dominant forces, often colonialism and white supremacy, that shape the way people encounter each other, how they live and interact. I'm going to close with a last connection point I have now here in my in this introduction that you can, as I say, access easily online. You can, there's a whole list of people who make up my disability culture lineage, that the people I choose to call into my lineage, the, the artists, the, the theorists, the thinkers, the doers, the dancers that are part of my lineage. So there's a long, long list of names. But an important connection point for my talk here with, with Jennifer is in my repertoire-based embodied and private lineage is my Tante, my great aunt, my Tante Lisa, who had cerebral palsy and was a farm worker for most of her life with no access to a love life, to sexual expression with others or to education. She was the one who first taught me about living well in pain, about ways of thinking creatively about the erotic, and who strongly supported my path away from my small German village toward the education denied to her. I was so lucky to sit side by side with her under trees, both of us chucking peas or peeling the potatoes she grew. I can still feel the sensations, dappled sunshine through the trees, a bowl on my knees, and that was a plastic bowl, and the nutritious plants heavy and moist, in my hands. My task in this book is to unsettle myself, embrace my unstable way of being in the world and in academia, and prepare and offer nourishment, a place to be, breathe, and sense into connection. I offer my pain and joy to others who experience their cultural location with ambivalence and with stumbling. Fantasies of other worlds are part of this, trying to find different gravities, different atmospheres. I can think about disability culture being a pie in the sky, an American formulation that emerges from a worker song written in 1911 by Swedish American labor activist and songwriter, Joe Hill, which he wrote as a parody of the Salvation Army hymn in the Swede by and by. Pointing to an elsewhere for one's reward is a powerful hegemonic mechanism of control. Now, quite a few years ago, writing about disability culture, I wrote about disability and crip culture being a moon on the horizon, an accessible castle in the air, a European fantasy image, a German fairy tale castle out of reach with its own heritage of feudalism and Disney dreams, mashed up with rams, soft pillows like this and talking elevators. Speculative dreams of happiness and communality are never easy, pure, or unadulterated, as performance studies writers like Jill Dolan and Jose Esteban Munoz have shown. Whether disability cultures are a thing or not is hard to decide, but my painful bones long for it, just as so many others look for cultural identification as a home, a place of certainty, a lineage of belonging. In this book, I show what it can be like to witness performances from the embodied and fantasized position of a disability culture observer. Disability culture becomes a felt and an acted process, not a thing. And that's what I try to invite you into with this meditation on what it is that you're sitting on. So once again, I'm closing by inviting you to breathe and to feel the support that the earth offers us as we are engaging with all our kin. Thank you. Just wanna hold that breath a moment. Thank you for that, Petra, that's amazing. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for your amazing book too. I just love thinking about lineages in connection to disability. It's so rare that people do, right? This is why our books are sort of at a certain moment here, right? A certain moment where more and more of us claim 
disability culture claim disability as a positive connective feature, not as something negative, not as something terrible, even though all around us people are still denying that positivity, right? I mean, that's what your what your book is, is making clear so strongly and so beautifully, this highly ambivalent way in which stigma works in our families. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's really interesting to me the way you're connecting um, and it's the somatic connection that you're making between sort of like family lineage, kinship, and culture with other disabled people, disabled body minds, right? And then with the earth, not just as this organic uh, sort of prelapsarian, you know, thing, but in all its messy complexity, in all the ways that it's lineated to capital, to, to all the bad stuff, right? Um, <laughs> I, that's really, really amazing to me. And I'd love to hear a little more about that. Um, something in my book that I didn't get to because I can't read the whole thing and bore everybody to tears was I'm really trying to work against this binary that I think is really false, um, that sort of I feel like I'm wounded by as a queer person, as well as someone in a disability community, uh, this false binary between sort of family of origin, which we assume to be traumatic, delineating, heteronormative, all those things like, um, and sort of chosen family kinship. And I, I kind of try to think about how disability lineage kind of can disrupt that um, and, and for that everybody has a right, first of all, to a family of origin, biological or not. We all came from a family and most turned to family at some point of origin. And, and uh, that really uh, ableism is one of the forces making the family traumatic and, and uh, defined against this sort of idealized chosen family that always falls apart and fails in all these ways, right? Um, so, so I was sort of trying to rethink that, um, but there's something in that, the tension between those two forces that I'm, I'm playing with and, and think disability lineage and, and the disability space can help us uh, complicate. And this relationship between sort of this embodiment and an earth that isn't just organic and inert. And uh, there, there's something in that that I'm really interested in. There's some connection that I see that I, I haven't figured out yet as I'm listening. So maybe you wanna talk about that. More. Oh, that's, that's lovely. <laughs> we could talk about it, but I think we also should talk more about, about your work there. So I, I agree that these are very interesting and related issues. You know, the notion of choice versus non-choice or in, in relation, particularly in environmental issues, it's, you know, whether we feel guilty about, you know, like and everything we touch, we feel guilty. You know, I could be feeling guilty about this leather. I mean, obviously, right? Right, um, right. Um, that is, and, and, and obviously at some level I do, I could feel, I mean, I talked about the blanket and the fish and the, you know, how everything sheds, how everything is connected. Um, and the point is not to not feel guilty and to, um, and to just sort of just consume away, but, but to become conscious of the effects that one's, one's living self has on other living selves, right? So, and I think that is something that your, your book also invites us into when we think about this notion, this difference between the, or the, the non-difference between the bio and the chosen family, how stigma operates. Because of course, stigma also operates really strongly in what we call chosen families, right? Right, That's really, right. Really, <laughs> you know, the ones that in some ways can also leave earlier sometimes, you know, like sometimes bio families hang around sometimes they don't you know so it's a it's co these are very complicated moments I would love you to talk about um the mo tell us about one moment of deep joy where your kind of archival search in your into your own family's history or the wider histories where it brings about this moment of joy I love hearing people speak about their joy yeah so it happened um when I was talking to my Scottish fam. I found this 
branch of my family and that I had met pieces of, I, I found them. I didn't know about this cousin Rona who had Down syndrome, who had a completely different trajectory than my cousin XY, right? So there was this moment of discovery of her and 97 year old great auntie twice removed pulls out this photo album and there is a 1950s photo, uh, right? Everyone's in their sort of Jewish middle-class Glasgow madman drag, you know? <laughs> and there is Rona glowing in this dress that echoes the dress my daughter chose mm. and visibly disabled, right? And there is my grandfather. Hmm. And it's a double moment of joy to me of discovering this connection and understanding that he knew about Rona and didn't accept a grandchild of his own in part because of his phobic relationship to this amazing, glowing, charismatic girl, right? So it's this very double moment of, you know, kitschy 50s, <laughs> like they couldn't look more, you know, 1953 and everyone's at some event, nobody remembered what it was when I asked some of the people, um, everyone's dressed in, in, to the hilt um, and glowing, you know, Rona is just glowing. And knowing that my grandfather couldn't encounter that as joy. Yeah. You know, that he brought back to the U.S. Uh, this ableism and inflicted it on us mm. in some way. Um, and of course, he's part of a cultural con, you know. Right, right, right. Um, uh, so, so that was a moment just that kind of ripped me out of time uh, mm. in some way in this research process. Um, and isn't that so important to have that gaze of desiring disability, right? You are, you're gazing with the search for disability, the, the looking for difference, and that <laughs> the softness in your voice as you're narrating this is so powerful, right? It's so, it's so beautiful. It is beautiful as it's written on the page as well. These yeah. moments of joyous encounter, which are different from just finding a research subject, right? But they're like, yeah. and the way you just narrated it and the way it's in the book as well is this the connection to the dress your daughter chose. I think that's a really, yeah. do you want to just talk about that a little bit more? And this? Yeah, so people who know me well will not be surprised. I'm not wearing a hat today because I was like, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll not do the hat thing. Um, but uh, I, you know, from my grand, my deaf grandmother inherited kind of, you know, this tactile love of, kind of weird textury clothes and like really bright colors. <laughs> and um, I, she really lived in the tactile and kind of dramatic um, clothing. And um, somehow that, when I was thinking of this metaphor of weaving together and sort of lineation, delineation, the line, the sewing, the raveling and the unraveling, I also kind of got interested in that more literally and tactilely mm -hmm. um, through the dress that Rona was wearing, the dress uh, my daughter was wearing, um, letting that be very literal in some sense, connecting back uh, to this metaphor. Um, and, you know, I'm like, I was sort of laughing at myself. Um, I quote the MLK quote that, you know, white people love to quote MLK, right? It's, it's like a tick. Um, but um, he, he talks about like the fabric of destiny. He, he uses these fabric metaphors. Mm -hmm. And I really was thinking about uh, that, that we're entwined, you know, in one another, the twine part. Mm -hmm. So that, so that tactility and physicality, 
um, had something to do with these are stories, but these were also people with bodies mm -hmm. and desires and minds and interests and tragedies. And so it's something about the materiality uh, of the photograph, of the clothing kept, you know, I'm making a story up. The facts are very questionable in all of this, right? right. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think that was something that grounded it and, and delineated in this whole other way. Um, I do want to answer some of the questions in the chat. If that's Absolutely. Okay. Let's go to the chat. What have we got there? Um, somebody's oh. asking about access. Yes, my book is um, in audio format. It's actually available now in audio format. You can, whatever platform you like, whether it's Evil Amazon, or you can go to Random House Penguin or Beacon. It is available as an audiobook narrated by a disabled um, interpreter. So the designer of the book was disabled, the interpreter was. Um, so you absolutely can listen to the book. Um, and that was very important to me. Um, and the question- and I, I can answer that one quickly too. Yeah. I just also put into the chat again, the open access version, which is an open access PDF that you can just like take and indeed listen to very easily. So go ahead. I'm and I'm glad that it gets it reaches out there. And should we look at the second one? Do you want to just read that out, sweetie? Yeah, sure. Could you share your views about lack of social avenues and access and social events for people with disabilities? Mm -hmm. How can the gap between young disabled adults and non-disabled adults be bridged? Um, you know, that's such a huge and important question. It goes back to the sorting. I'm really you know, I want to hold these two things together. One is every space should be an accessible space. Every space. We have to work towards that. And everybody needs community with people where you don't have to fucking fight for access. And I've really seen that. That my, And I am sort of a little bit of a nerd and a little bit of a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not a real groupy, groupy person. But I've seen that my daughter and my family really need community of our own where we understand our access needs. And we need to be fully included. One of my examples about that is kids films. This is a big, but if you, if you are a parent, you have been to a Disney film or, or some horrible kids film in a movie theater with a million kids, you know, that's not marked as accessible. Scree kids are screaming, diapers are being changed, kids are crying, it's blasted so loud you wouldn't believe it, um, right? And then, and then there are these special accessible showings, right? But the truth is there's nothing my kid or any kid is doing that couldn't be in that regular space, right? How is stimming any more distracting than all the things the other kids are doing? But that's how ableism works, right? It decides that stimming is really weird and, and disruptive and the kid going, but I want isn't disruptive, right? Um, so I, I really challenge that any space that can't include all bodies and minds, um, you know, is a fascist space at the end of the day. So that's something I'm always pushing against. And at the same time, I think especially disabled young adults need community and, and identity um, on their own terms. You kind of have to find your people. Um, and I think Petra speaks, you know, swimming, the, the, that, that image of the swimming. Um, and we've had to really create it. And some of our peeps are on the Zoom tonight. In fact, um, we've really had to create that. And, and that's something that when we got the diagnosis, not a single clinician, not a single doctor said, find your community. Nobody said that. And that is so important, right? That is such a central part of this all right, I think we're coming to the end. There's a beautiful question in the Q&A, but um, maybe there, we do there, still have time there to address are two, one. There are two questions in the Q&A. Yes, yeah. there's absolutely time. I, I wanted to encourage anyone else with final questions. We will be wrapping up in a moment, but Petra and Jennifer, if you would like to answer those questions, we do have a little bit of time. 
Sure. I'm happy to. The first one there is by Kate Lynch. This question is unformed. It sounds very formed to me, Kate. A member of my chosen family said to me she felt it was irresponsible to sell joy. How can we share our joy while acknowledging suffering in our writing? Yes, yes. <laughs> it's like my answer would be yes. We don't <laughs> need pride writing that just does nothing but rah, rah, rah. Disability is great. You know, there's pain, there is exclusion, there's stigma. We're dealing with an inaccessible world. We're dealing with a racist world. We're dealing with the misogynistic and transphobic and anti queer and white supremacist world. We're dealing with all that stuff. But the only resource we have is joy, you know, is joy and community. So, it's very important to celebrate as well as critique to find a balance that allows us to live and I think that's what both of, us, of our writings try to aim for right we're not trying to create some kind of um, beautiful utopia that's that's just not not in this world but we're trying to reach to these moments of connections you finding the image me finding comfort in that moment when I am stimming with the blanket when I am finding a connection in pain when I'm finding a connection with the dancers that I move with yeah so those are it is really important I think to find that balance and to never just get stuck in any one side do you yeah. want to take question <laughs> yeah I completely agree with that and I think you don't have to sugarcoat the challenges the, the just objective challenges of pain and impairment right um that all humans will face actually that's that's part of of the condition of being embodied right and in minded right um to also see the resources and joy that come from that um so I think, you know, that's part of kind of the brilliance of a lot of disability art to me is that doubleness and the way they're threaded around each other, threaded, I can't get out of my own metaphor here, right? Um, so I, I think that's, that threading of them together is, is the authentic and truthful and, uh, uh kind of non-commodif there's something not commodifiable when you really engage both dimensions of that it works against the super cryptic it works against all that stuff i think um is there i'm not seeing another question is there another one or are we good there there is another question in the q a module if uh, either of you feel comfortable with it answering now. Uh, it's from R.A. Can oh, yeah. you speak to the cultural erasure of the elderly as age makes them disabled? Yes, age does erase people. And a more accessible world would erase much fewer of us. So I think everything we said applies, of course, for any kind of situation of aging as well. Many people just like suddenly find themselves disabled and go, oh, oh, now I understand why people might like to have subtitles. Oh, maybe we should just put more funding into subtitling, you know? So it, it any any of the things we're talking about here, any of the audio, audio describing mechanisms, subtitling, uh, offering more relaxed performance venues where one can go to the loo more often, uh, finding ways of having more curb cuts, getting people around, providing public transport. All of these things are super useful for, for elders too. And um, since most of us will be getting older at some point or the other, it'll be very useful to start funding that kind of stuff now. We learned a lot in the COVID crisis as well about becoming more accessible to one another. Absolutely. Um, the only thing I'd add to that is I think the fear of aging, infirmity, disability fuels a lot at, at that end of life, fuels a lot of the ableism and phobia um, around disabled body, minds, and children, and others, um, that it's, it, 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 there's so much fear and lack of knowledge and experience of how to age, how to be a disabled elder, and instead of learning from and embracing what disabled people already know about that, um, there's denial, like the new age world is just, you know, <laughs> rife with this um, 
denial um, and ableist phobia really fueling it all about our own fragility, complexity, aging, and death. So that's a very um, upbeat note to end on. But um, <laughs> well, I, I th <laughs> thank you. I, I did actually want to um, participate in that in that question as well uh, as someone who has um, an invisible physical illness that I've had since I was a child that when I would be suddenly unable as someone who is sometimes physically disabled and sometimes not people will suddenly treat me very differently and I have to say I deal with this all the time you just can't see it all the time and comments of oh you poor thing that you're dealing with this when you're so young from having to deal with it as a child um, and as if people of any age should not be disabled because only elderly people should be disabled and why can't conversation be that anyone can be disabled at any age and it doesn't have to be a poor thing um, Petra, when you mentioned curb cuts, it's something I think about every day living in a city as someone who uses a cane, um, that everyone benefits from curb cuts, right? That when people talk about ramps and the expense of renovating venues and buildings, it's the invisible accessibility like curb cuts that people with strollers and bikes and city carts, everyone uses curb cuts. And even if they don't realize it's because of access needs, it serves us all. Um, so if I, I, if I could just say thank you from a personal standpoint, Jennifer and Petra, it meant a lot to me to be hosting and listening to you both. And that comment about all we have is sharing joy, just, Thank you to all of our attendees and for your questions. Um, please support Greenlight Bookstore and understandably, if you do not have the means to the fact that there are available resources online, if you can't support us, please support our authors. Um, and the conversation is always ongoing. If you are not someone who already follows disability Twitter, um, there, there are voices to be heard. So thank you everyone for tonight's conversation. Thank you. And thank yeah. you, Jennifer, for inviting me in. I so appreciate it. It was beautiful. Thank, thank you, you for your amazing presence and brilliant book. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for sharing that. Thanks for, for Greenlight for hosting us. And thanks yeah. everybody. Yeah, really nice to meet you all. <laughs> bye bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Good night.